Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Deb. Um, thank you all. Um, as probably everyone watching me right now is aware, either here in the room or virtually, obtaining quality long-term care for FTD can be extremely difficult. Simply put, dementia care is not designed for the needs of families facing young onset dementia like FTD. As a result, the FTD journey ends up being that much more difficult. But there are people working to address the gaps in long-term services and support for FTD. Jelaine Arias of the Georgia State University of Public Health is here to offer guidance about FTD's specific care needs and to talk about ways of ensuring that those needs are addressed in public health policy going forward. Welcome, Jelaine. Good afternoon. I am told that I don't actually have to stand at the mic, um, which my mock trial team members would know. I, I tend to dance when I walk. That was always my thing in mock trial. People said, you need to stop dancing because I was moving so much. But I am going to actually try to stand away from the podium today. It is an honor to be here, and it is humbling to stand in front of this group um, and to share my work with you. Um, it is doubly humbling to stand on the same stage that Bruce Miller just spoke at, but I am going to do my darndest. So <laughs> here is my hidden agenda. I would love to stand here in front of you today and say I'm going to give you all of the secrets and tell you what to tell the long-term care services when they say that you can't get access or how to talk to a long-term care insurance provider. Unfortunately, where we're at from a policy perspective doesn't allow me to do that. So instead, I'm going to say two things and I'm going to say them again, and it's what Matt just said. Number one, you are not alone. When I share my research today, I'm sure that many of you will say, I have thought that before, I have heard that before, or I have seen that before. In fact, many of you could probably give this talk better than I. And the second thing I hope you walk away from is that there are researchers like me, not just me, I am but one of many, but there are researchers like me who take this seriously. These issues keep me up at night, they light a fire in me every morning, and they are what drive me to keep showing up to my office and to teach students and to train, train, train our trainees to think about these research issues in a meaningful way. I don't have to tell this group what long-term care services are, but it is just a baseline to, uh, sort of foundational setting point to understand that in the United States, we consider long-term care services to be non-medical services provided to individuals generally aimed to assist with activities of daily living. They come in different formats, nursing home, residential care, assisted uh, facilities. And yet, while FTD may be one of those diseases there where we need these services the most, it is also an area that is currently understudied. In fact, when we're looking at issues of long-term care services and supports, we rarely look at them and how they would be applied or affect those with early onset dementias like FTD. Yes, there are a few studies like those that I've shown on this slide where people are really trying to dig into this issue. But typically, most research out there on long-term care services is not applicable to FTD for a couple of reasons. I present this one example. This is a phenomenal study out of Oregon Health Sciences University where they started to look at different ways and factors to measure how long-term care services were being used by people with dementia. You can't see it, but in the small text down there, you see that this applies to dual um, eligible participants, meaning that they're both eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. And as de by definition, that means that they are over the age of 65. That is leaving behind a whole cohort of people who need access to these services who are under the age of 65 and are experiencing symptoms that may sort of actually make them ineligible for many of the services they need. But we can still learn a lot from this broader literature, some key things to keep in place that long-term care services, regardless of the condition that you have or the age that you are, it's not in a great place, to be honest. Number one, it is incredibly expensive. We've seen studies time and time again demonstrate the cost of long-term care services. And importantly, something that is often missed is that health insurance and Medicare do not pay for most long-term care services, which means over 50 to 60% of long-term care services are paid for by Medicaid. And as a result, the population that struggles with it the most is actually our middle class. Our middle class is the largest group in the country, but they are also the one population that cannot pay for these services out of pocket, nor do they qualify for Medicaid. 
So this results in some tricky work that you've probably met with elder attorneys who can walk you through how to spend down your assets so you can qualify for Medicaid so you can pay for long-term care services. Frankly, that's not the way that it should be. In fact, with work that I've been doing with Krista Harrison and Jing Lee, we started to dig into some larger scale data to understand exactly how much of long-term care services are being paid for out of pocket. Turns out a significant portion, and it's a significant portion of people's income. And so the obvious answer you might say is, well, if so many people are going to need long-term care services and it's so expensive, isn't this the perfect place for a private long-term care insurance market? Turns out not so much. So first of all, private long-term care insurance is not the best product that we have when it comes to long-term uh, to insurances. There's a lot of limitations on how individuals can use it. There's elimination periods, means even once you become eligible for services, there's a gap period in which you're not able to use the insurance product. There's benefit triggers, which means that insurers are establishing barriers or thresholds that you have to meet in order to become eligible. And then there's benefit caps. And for many people with chronic conditions like the dementias and particularly FTD, lifetime and, and annual caps make this a product that's not going to cover the services you need. Additionally, it turns out that long-term care services um, or insurance is harder to get than you would imagine. Uh, medical underwriting is not only allowed, but it is encouraged under current policies. Meaning that if you look at the model law that most states use to develop um, their laws around long-term care insurance, that model law specifically says that insurers should be collecting all medical information needed to determine whether or not somebody should get insurance and what their premiums could be. So as you can imagine in a familial disease like FTD, a lot of people that need this product are not actually going to be able to get it. And we see these stories time and time again when we talk to caregivers who tell us that the moment their loved one brought up even a hint of dementia, a hint of concern about their memory, they became ineligible to be able to access long-term care insurance. So if not private long-term care insurance, then what? The government has tried multiple um, policies to try to figure out how do we how do we start to solve this financial problem that is long-term care services? We've not found a viable solution yet. States like Washington State have established a public initiative to establish a sort of opt-in model where you could use over time your insurance or your, your employer to kind of build up. Um, the challenge with programs like uh, Washington, which I, I don't want to bash on Washington, it's actually one of my favorite states in the country, <laughs> and I uh, applaud them for putting this in. They're one of the first states to do it, but the coverage actually isn't going to get people very far, unfortunately. I am glad to see that state and federal policies are moving forward, including our federal government, which is finally starting to take long-term care issues seriously and, and, and starting to drive policies forward. However, the truth is, is that future work is needed to understand how these policy changes would affect individuals and families with FTD um, who are needing these kinds of services. Because time and time again, when I look at this, I say, this is great for somebody who's 65, 70, or 80. But what happens when somebody has an early onset disease like FDD, um, and how do we overcome those challenges? In my work, we've started with qualitative research. I like to talk, not surprising, I'm standing here on stage, which means I also like to talk to people, and I love to hear their stories. I love to hear the firsthand account of what they're, the, how they're experiencing this disease. So we spoke to 13 caregivers who reflected on their experience in caregiving um, and about these 13 patients. We found a whole bunch of themes in the results, you know, of things that we could learn from um, this population. But today I'm just going to focus on a, on a small subset, really, to sort of hone in on the things that I think affect caregiving um, and caregiving issues the most. The first is that we heard from our caregivers concerns about safety and vulnerability. That our caregivers said that one of the hardest challenges about caregiving and caregiving burden for this disease population specifically, as many of you guys probably know, is that because of the symptoms that go along with FTD, this population is more likely to be vulnerable for you know, different kinds of uh, fraud or exploitation. And so that really increases the need for caregivers to be vigilant about where their, um, where their loved one is at any given time. Additionally, challenges early on in the disease, um, which often can be a path to a, a diagnosis, are, are some of these financial decision making and the financial damage that can actually be done early in the disease when we don't know that it's FTD yet and individuals are making financial poor, or poor financial decisions. And yet we hear caregivers who are very optimistic. They feel like this is like what they, were, they want to do, this is where they want to be, this is what they want their priority to be. 
They just need the support to do it. And I think that many of you in the room would probably say something very similar to this. Except for we still have our caregivers who are feeling burdened. And that's incredibly important for researchers like me to consider. And part of that burden comes from the abusive behaviors. We heard stories of different behaviors that could or could not be categorized as abusive depending on how you looked at it. But regardless, it was a challenge for caregivers and caregivers' families. We heard about lack of insight and barriers, meaning that it was really hard when the patient didn't understand their disease or understand that the reaction they were having to something was difficult. An anecdote from this, this study was actually, we did a parallel study in early onset Alzheimer's disease. And we had a really hard time recruiting um, FTD caregivers because of the caregiver burden. Additionally, during our interviewing process, me and my research team member at the time who were collecting our interviews were repeatedly interrupted because caregivers needed to step away from the interview to take care of an issue at hand. This, for me, was really eye-opening and important and part of the data to consider. And so what we know and, and what Dr. Miller pointed out this morning is that the impact of caregiver burden is huge. This is something that we can't ignore. It is actually a determinant of somebody else's health and it is a driver of their well-being. And so we need to think more importantly about how we deal with these issues. And some of that burden also flows out of liability of increased legal risk. So we, we heard Dr. Miller this morning talk about the relationship between uh, FTD and uh, criminal behavior. So in our interviews alone, we did 13 interviews, eight of our participants, eight, reported activities that we as researchers considered could be criminal, eight. And of those, four, only four explicitly recognized it as such. And what we noticed is that caregivers are so overwhelmed and burdened that they're focused on you know, perception and how things can be viewed by strangers. Um, and they don't want to report this as well, right? Because of the potential consequences. We are seeing more frequently the literature starting to pick up on the fact that the, the relationship between dementias across the board and criminality, that there may be a relationship. And so what does that mean? Well, it turns out my, my lab's also doing a little bit of work on this. So the question I had is what happens when somebody with dementia gets arrested and ends up in this system? This is the United States legal criminal justice system. This is a map of it. And I, as a legally trained professional, look at this and I get overwhelmed. So I cannot imagine being a family or a patient seeing this and trying to figure out what the next steps are. So we started, we started asking some questions. The first question we asked is I said, okay, so if somebody is arrested and they go to trial, what is, what is their likely defense? I said, the obvious one is that probably it's guilty by not reason of insanity. And so we tried to determine whether or not that would actually apply. In our analysis, we found that Trying to use that defense for something like dementia is an ill-fitted puzzle piece. You can, you can massage it around and whatnot, but when we looked at the case law, most judges didn't understand how to differentiate between dementia, particularly something like FTD and psychiatric illnesses. We also did interviews with attorneys. We talked to 15 uh, attorneys and asked them about their experience with dementia, what they understood, how they would go about identifying it. <clears throat> and in this situation, we determined that there was two threshold issues. Number one, the current US uh, criminal justice system has no mechanism in place to screen somebody for dementia after arrest. So if somebody shows up into the jail system and they start showing symptoms, there's three ways that, they get, that somebody gets determined as they have dementia. First of all, they have a well-trained attorney that happens to have familial experience or some other prior exposure to dementia. We heard that from almost all of our attorneys. Number two, the family members, so those caregivers are here in the audience, advocate. They say, you should know that my husband just had a diagnosis of X kind of dementia or Y kind of dementia, right? So there's some family member, but we can't always rely on family members for this. And as Dr. Miller demonstrated before, that criminal activity may actually be the first symptom. So these people may be showing up to the criminal justice system without a diagnosis. The second threshold issue that we found was that there's no placement option available for individuals who are arrested with dementia. We heard from our attorneys over and over again that they recognized that jails and prisons are not well suited for this population. One, because of their vulnerability, also because of their age. Uh, if you have, I've, it's been a while since I've been in a jail or a prison, but they're not necessarily physically built for older adults or anybody with a disability. Yet, in some states, they're not eligible for st uh, state hospitalization 
or they do not have funding or like the, the you know, insurance to be able to get access to hospitalization. And now because of the criminal justice record, <laughs> they're ineligible for long-term care services or housing, right? And so this, this creates a big issue in our system because if we're gonna start to promote what I would hope is a system to detect dementia at the time of arrest, we need a place to place these individuals that is safe for themselves and for others, particularly when returning back to the community is not an option. So let's just shift gears real quick and talk quickly about long-term care planning. When we spoke to our 13 caregivers, we heard time and time again that long-term care planning had not happened, that it was something that maybe they knew needed to happen, but they were either overwhelmed with it or their loved one didn't want to discuss it, or they were kind of hoping they would be able to find other solutions. This goes back to this bigger challenge that we're seeing. If we don't have a financial system set up to be able to pay for long-term care services, and our clinicians don't have the time to counsel around long-term care services, how do we help our patients and our family members navigate the system that, again, is pretty ill-equipped for our disease population? The only recommendation that I'm going to leave this group with, um, and it's, this is the former ethicist. I was a clinical ethicist for five years, um, and so I, once an ethicist, always an ethicist, has to say that if you can have the opportunity to have discussions around advanced directives, including living wills and power of attorneys, have those conversations now. This is gonna help in a couple of ways. Number one, it's gonna make sure that you know who the, the decision maker is. A lot of times, particularly parents, mine included, I have two older brothers, they say, oh, you guys will figure it out. Siblings will figure it out. It's fine, you guys have got it. We don't need to write it down. Let me tell you, I've seen a lot of families that had it figured out and not have it so figured out when it came time to make decisions because it's just the nature of the beast. Siblings disagree when it comes to making decisions about their parents. So number one is like, know who your decision maker is gonna be, have that written down. Also, save every clinical ethicist's mind and don't put down two people equally never goes well. Um, the second thing is the, the make, how is a decision made? So the reason why it's important to pick somebody is it's not to pick your favorite child. Um, I tell my mom that all the time. She doesn't listen. Um, the point is to pick the person who you think can actually use substituted judgment. And so what I mean by that is who is the person in your life that will make the difficult decision regardless of where their emotions are? We see it all the time where somebody picks the super sensitive son, right? Who loves his mom more than anything. But when it comes time to make the really hard decisions, he's not the one that can step into that role to do it. So as you're thinking about your decision maker, think about who is the one that can think logically and clearly in a time of high stress, high emotion, to carry out your wishes the way that you would want them done. So where do we go from here? Like I said at the top, I would love to stand here and tell you that I've solved all the problems. I started working for Dr. Bruce Miller, I think in 2016, <laughs> and I told him I was gonna solve all the world's problems by 2020, it didn't happen, and there was a whole other problem that we had to deal with. I promise you, we are working on it in our lab. Um, so we right now have ongoing studies hoping to try to better understand what are the legal levers that sort of drive access to and, and, and use of long-term care services. We're continuing to analyze our data to better understand where are the policy mechanisms that we could potentially push on. We're also starting to explore these issues through a lens of disparities and, and, and social determinants of health, recognizing that not everybody gets the same access to the same level of services and trying to find solutions to that. My long-term goal is to change law and to change policy. Hopefully, maybe one of my trainees will be able to do that. But until then, I really hope to be able to find, find ways to develop tools for clinicians to be able to use to get better guide patients and families as they navigate these difficult decisions. I do not do this work in a vacuum. In fact, I have a phenomenal team. I've had amazing mentors. Um, I've had the pleasure of being a Global Brain Health Institute fellow working at the UCSF before I, I joined Georgia State. I'm incredibly grateful that the NIH thought funding a lawyer was a good idea um, about five years ago and continues to do so. Um, just please keep sending those uh, healthy, happy vibes to Bethesda because I've got one more grant going before council in about two weeks. <laughs> um, but very grateful mostly to all of the research team members who've joined and the participants. Without those participants who said, I'm busy, I'm a caregiver, I've got a lot, but I'm willing to talk to you. I wouldn't be able to understand how to move this research forward and how to move this topic forward. So thank you.
thank you so much, Delane. Um, sorry we don't have time to do questions, um, but hopefully you'll be sticking around for the reception. Um, I'd also like to point out that our AFTD is increasing our advocacy efforts to address the challenges with our healthcare system that Jelaine just discussed. We have already begun connecting with lawmakers on the state and federal level to achieve these goals, and we are working on developing an advocacy agenda that reflects the urgent needs of our community. Of course, we will need your help, so please stay tuned to AFTD's website and email communications for news about our emerging advocacy campaigns that you can participate in, ensuring that when policymakers policy debate long-term dementia care, our community will have a seat at the table. It's now time for another break, so please get up, stretch, um, walk around, um, be sure to visit the exhibitor booths in the hallway outside the ballroom, and virtually using the AFTD app um, then at 3.15 Central Time, uh, please find your way to your afternoon breakout session. For those of you joining the breakout session entitled Sharing Your Experiences to Advance FTD Science, simply make your way back here to the ballroom at quarter after. Uh, for everyone else, your breakout sessions will be held in landmark rooms 5, 6, or 7 on the AFTD app. And we'll all meet back here at 4.30 Central for our final session. Thank you.